Well, thank you, Cheryl, for that uh, very generous uh, introduction. I'm very uh, appreciative of that and appreciative of the opportunity uh, to be back here in Madison and, and with you all. Uh, I want to return in full measure uh, Cheryl's nice compliments about the American Benefits Council and to say that, you know, while we're in Washington, D.C., sort of dealing with all of these public policy issues a little bit more, maybe sometimes in the ivory tower, uh, you all are here in the trenches, and I know what a phenomenal job uh, the Alliance does uh, for you all in that regard, and, and so I applaud uh, all of you for participating, and uh, Cheryl and her great team for the work that they do. So, uh, 25 years, that's really quite a, uh, uh, an amazing accomplishment. Uh, I did some you know, reading up on the history uh, of the Alliance, and uh, I know how it, it started out uh, rather small, and, and sort of this room is evidence uh, of the excellent work that you've done. And I was thinking about that 25-year uh, accomplishment. It reminded me of that, that line from one of Shakespeare's plays that's, at a quarter century, thou doth have success. And you certainly demonstrated that with, uh, with all the work that you've done. And um, now you might wonder why it is that I, I know this rather obscure uh, line from Shakespeare. It's because I've always been a great fan of Shakespeare for a number of reasons, uh, not the least of which he and I share the same birthday. Uh, born in April, and my parents sent out the birth announcement, said I was a Midsummer Night's Dream. You can do the math yourself and back it up. The answer is July. Um, and as I was thinking about it more, you know, I realized pretty much anything that you would want to say about health policy could be summed up in something that Shakespeare has said in one or more of his plays. So, I don't know what the official title was of the speech that you assigned me, but what I really want to talk about with you today is a Shakespearean look at healthcare policy. And it's a play in four acts. So let me kind of run through the, uh, the agenda for you. The prelude, of course, to this Shakespearean play, and I don't know, by the way, whether it's a comedy or a tragedy. We'll have to wait till the end to find out the answer to that. <laughs> is to set the political stage. Because really, everything that either happens or doesn't happen as it relates to policy is dependent upon the politics of it, ultimately. Act one, of course, is the aftermath of the Affordable Care Act, and that's where we'll spend the lion's share of the time today. Then we need to move into act two, which is what might happen after we get over the hump of some of these Affordable Care Act issues, and, uh, and the plot thickens, as they say. Act three is the long-term strategic vision. Cheryl asked me if I would talk about uh, a vision document that our organization uh, developed that also tries to shape what health benefits might look like or, or what type of public policies would need to be in effect in order to have the legislative and regulatory environment to enable employers like all of you and the rest of our members to actually be able to sponsor the plans that you sponsor. And then lastly, sort of act for a political outlook since we're coming up here on an election year, and that too will have a big impact on the future of healthcare policy. So let's just jump right into it. Shakespeare said that uh, all the world's a stage and all the men and women are merely players. So what is that stage? If you can pretend that we're in the Globe Theater, not Congress. Normally I would have a little picture of a Capitol Dome, but we'll make it the Globe Theater in London here. Uh, this shows you the, the breakdown between the U.S. House of Representatives uh, and the U.S. Uh, Senate. And, and as you can see, uh, in the House, there are 247 Republicans to 188 Democrats. This is the largest Republican majority in the House at any time since the 1920s. A little bit more on that in a moment. Over in the Senate, the Republican majority is 54 to 46, and that's also very relevant, those particular numbers, for reasons that I'll get to in just one second here. So let's start out with the House. Well, what do these numbers tell us? Well, they tell me the distinction between the majority and control. If you're the majority party in either the House or the Senate, you know, you get to chair all the committees, you get to decide which bills are going to get voted on and when. But having control is quite another story, as Speaker Boehner and his leadership team have obviously uh, found out. Uh, because notwithstanding the fact that they have the largest majority in 90 years, um, he has obviously, the Speaker, been unable to uh, control certain elements of his caucus and at any given time rustle up the 218 votes needed 
to actually move forward uh, his agenda, and for that matter, to retain his, his speakership. And you know, what is the reason for this? I mean, there are, are many reasons and many theories, but I don't think that we can overlook the fact that at least one contributing factor to the dynamics in the House of Representatives uh, is the result of congressional redistricting, which, as you know, happens every 10 years, but is not done by Congress. It's done by the governors and the state legislatures who redraw the boundaries of the congressional districts. And what has happened, particularly over the last two cycles, in 2012 and in 22, is these congressional districts have been drawn in such a way as to really make the, the Republican districts more solidly Republican and the Democratic districts more solidly Democratic. So consequently, of the 435 seats in the House, there probably are no more than 80, 100, 100 at the most, that are actually so-called swing districts that are in play. With all the other districts, it's a foregone conclusion that whoever the Republican nominee or the Democratic nominee will be uh, is going to determine the outcome. What impact does that have on this dynamic? The impact that it has is that it makes the primary elections so much more important in most of the districts than the general elections. And as the nature of the voters in primaries, they tend to be further to the right in the Republican primaries and further to the left in the Democratic primaries. If these were truly competitive seats in the House, then the prevailing candidate would have to be somebody who's able to you know, attract some independents and some people even from the other side of the aisle. But in the districts that are sort of foregone going to be Republican or Democratic, uh, then the person who is sort of represents the, the true base of the party is going to be the nominee. And so what that has meant was that the dynamics of this Republican caucus uh, have changed rather dramatically over the past several years. Uh, and, and there's this group of about 40 uh, who are uh, not pleased with either the, the policies or the process that the leadership has, has put into place. So it's a very, very different kind of a place. And having a large majority doesn't necessarily uh, uh, translate into control. So as Juliet said to Romeo, parting is such sweet sorrow, and Speaker Boehner has said, farewell, I'm, I'm leaving tomorrow, and uh, your neighbor, Paul Ryan, is going to be presumably elected as Speaker of the House uh, on, on Thursday. What's the, uh, what's the situation over in the Senate? Well, here too, there is an important distinction between majority and control, but it's very, very different in terms of how it uh, plays itself out. Uh, as I said before, uh, the Republicans have just 54 votes, but in the Senate, under the Senate rules, you need to have 60 votes in order to overcome a filibuster, to overcome a delay tactic on the part of the minority party. So consequently, the Republican majority leader of the Senate, Mitch McConnell, is having just as much trouble as his Democratic predecessor did uh, in terms of actually being able to move forward the agenda because he doesn't have the 60 votes, nor did Harry Reid, who was his predecessor on the Democratic side. And so on anything that's really meaningful, anything that's really controversial, it's really hard to make it move through, uh, through, the, through that body, even though they have, because it's statewide elections, they don't have the same type of situation that I just described in the House a moment ago. Now, because the dynamics are a little bit different in terms of the way we elect senators and, and, uh, and representatives, um, the it's more likely in the Senate that we'll see some switches back and forth because uh, every two years we elect a third of the Senate. Um, you know, the Republicans, as we know, uh, regained the majority uh, back last year in 2014. And there were a number of reasons for this, but not the least of which, however, was the fact that there were nearly as many uh, Democratic seats up for re-election as there were Republican seats. So there were many, many more opportunities for the Republicans to pick up uh, a seat from the other side. But what happens next year in 2016? Well, the situation exactly reverses itself. There are 24 Republican seats that must be defended, but only 10 Democratic seats. That means that the Democrats have more than twice as many opportunities as the Republicans to pick up a seat next year. And so notwithstanding all the other political dynamics, all the other issues, whoever may be at the top of the respective tickets in terms of the presidential candidates, the simple math suggests that the Democrats are starting out with a distinct advantage this next year, just like the Republicans had a distinct advantage last year. So we could see the Senate very likely uh, swap over once again. 
So that's kind of the political stage before I kind of jump into act two here on the policy. Any questions or comments anybody wants to make uh, relative to the politics of what's going on? Okay, act one, the Affordable Care Act, aftermath. Can one desire too much of a good thing, Shakespeare asked. Well, apparently according to Congress and economists across the philosophical spectrum, the answer to that is yes, which is why they enacted the Cadillac tax. They think that there is far too much of a good thing in terms of the demands of employees for more and more generous uh, health care coverage. Um, you all know the specifics of, of sort of how the Cadillac tax operates. Let me, ask, let me actually ask a question. How many of you are already have made or this coming year will be making changes to your health plan in order to avoid being on a trajectory to trigger the tax in 2018. Just raise your hands. That is almost exactly consistent with this Aon Hewitt study that found that uh, this year, in 2015, a third of employers made changes. And this has been a very important um, uh, aspect of the message that uh, those of us who are lobbying on this issue related to the Cadillac tax have been trying to convey to Congress because it is so often uh, sort of the, the, the manner in which they do business is to run things up against the deadline. Well, we, we really can't have them uh, running this up against the deadline of December 31st, 2017, right? Changes are happening now. Implications are being felt uh, all, already. Um, and as you know, I think from this Towers Watson study, and there have been a number of others as well, uh, fully 48% uh, of employers are reporting that at least one of the plans that they sponsor is likely to trigger the tax in 2018, and just five years later, that number rises to 82%. Why was the Cadillac tax included in the Affordable Care Act itself to begin with? There really are two answers to that question. Uh, the first is that there is this widely held belief. Uh, as I say, it's, it's widely held uh, among a number of members of Congress, more so back in 2010 than today, I think. Uh, widely held within the uh, Obama administration, widely held among economists of all philosophical stripes, that this kind of a mechanism will mitigate the demand for increased health care costs, and it will serve to, uh, to slow down the rise in, in health care spending. The other piece of it, of course, is that uh, it helps to pay for other aspects of the Affordable Care Act, specifically the money to be raised from uh, the, this provision of the law uh, is intended to help pay for the subsidies to in individuals who obtain their coverage in the state public exchanges. The, pub the uh, Congressional Budget Office estimates that the Cadillac tax will raise $91 billion over the course of the next 10 years. And as Shakespeare would say about that, Lord, what fools these mortals be. Because let me tell you how it is that they come up with that $91 billion figure. They estimate that about a quarter of that $91 billion will come from actually imposing that 40% tax on those plans that actually exceed the thresholds and trigger it. Uh, and question sort of how many employers are going to actually willingly pay a 40% non-deductible tax on top of what is already, by definition, a very expensive health plan. But the other three quarters of this 91 billion is to be derived in a very different way than would be appearing at first blush, shall we say. They believe that they make two assumptions. The first assumption is a fairly reasonable one, that employers will do everything within their power uh, to adjust their plans in order to keep the cost of those plans uh, below the threshold that would trigger the tax, reasonable enough. The second assumption is that you, the employers, will take all of that savings that you've achieved in your health plans and pay it out to the employees dollar for dollar in the form of taxable wages. How many people are going to do that, by the way? So um, most of the tax revenue that is estimated to come from the Cadillac tax is really estimated to come not from the tax itself, but from income tax uh, on your employees. So if the Congressional Budget Office in its estimations and its assumptions is correct, this will actually be a massive tax increase uh, on working Americans. If, on the other hand, they're wrong, then 
that $91 billion of revenue will, act, will really never materialize. Now, clearly, some of it will materialize. I mean, there will be some plans that are going to you know, exceed the thresholds and pay the tax. There will be some employers who, to some extent, will, of course, make it up to employees uh, in the form of additional uh, wages if, if they have to ratchet back on health plans. But it certainly is not going to be anything approaching $91 billion. So this is another one of the sort of obstacles that we're facing with respect to sort of the public dialogue, the discourse, the debate around the future of the Cadillac tax. Misery acquaints a man with strange bedfellows. Well, the misery of the Cadillac tax has uh, enabled uh, a group of very, very strange bedfellows to get together uh, to form a coalition that Cheryl talked about. Uh, it's the other alliance. It's the alliance to fight the 40. And we realized that, um, that you had this odd assortment of strange bedfellows who shared a common concern uh, about the implications of the Cadillac tax for the future of employer-sponsored health care coverage. Not just private employers, but public employer groups. We have the National Association of Counties and the Government Finance Officers Association, labor unions, nonprofit organizations. We're very, very proud and appreciative that the Alliance is one of the initial members uh, of this coalition, uh, which has been working on, on, on this important matter. Well, where do we stand with this issue? I uh, need to take a few minutes here to kind of delve into this. There actually have been four different bills introduced in Congress, two in the House and two in the Senate, to fully repeal the 40 percent uh, tax. Um, they are bipartisan, a word that we don't hear bandied about in Washington, D.C. very much these days. Um, and between the two House bills, there's now on the order of 260 members of Congress, both almost evenly split between Republicans and Democrats, more Democrats than Republicans, uh, who have co-sponsored one or both of these bills to repeal the tax. So that's well more than a majority, if this ever would come up for a direct vote on the floor of the House of Representatives. Over in the Senate, there also are two bills, also very bipartisan. Interestingly enough, while there are more Democrats on the bills in the House, there are more Republicans on the bills in the Senate. But about roughly a third of the Senate uh, has co-sponsored legislation to repeal the Cadillac tax. Um, You'll probably be hearing a lot in the uh, media. In fact, I think it's the front page of today's um, um, uh, paper uh, that talks about the budget showdown that's, that's going on. Well, when the House of Representatives just last week uh, put together its uh, so-called budget reconciliation bill, that's sort of looking at sort of asking each of the committees of the House of Representatives to sort of do their little piece of the federal budget for the coming fiscal year, uh, there were a number of provisions that were included in there that relate to the Affordable Care Act. Um, very controversial issues, like repeal of the individual mandate, repeal of the employer mandate, um, but other provisions as well, including the repeal of the auto enrollment provision, which I think you may uh, know is uh, applicable once the Department of Labor would get around to actually issuing guidance, and repeal of the 40% excise tax. And it was very significant, in fact, uh, the chairman of the Tax Writing House Ways and Means Committee, Paul Ryan, uh, who is soon to become the speaker, uh, actually, he had been resisting the calls for repeal of the 40% tax, but he spoke out very forcefully uh, about the need to repeal it and the problems that it, was, uh, that it was creating. So we hope that he will remember that as this moves forward. Nobody really expected this House budget reconciliation measure to end up on the president's desk because even if it got through or to become law, I should say, because even if it got also through uh, the Senate, undoubtedly President Obama would veto any measure that would repeal the individual mandate and the employer mandate. But what they've now done is a way of sort of trying to uh, wrap some things up before Speaker Boehner leaves office this week, uh, is put together a grand measure that's going to raise the debt ceiling and continue the operations of the government. Um, and it does still include in there the uh, uh, repeal of the auto enrollment but the repeal of the 40% excise tax was dropped from the, uh, from the agreement. So sort of the good news is uh, the issue got elevated uh, to, uh, to an extent that it was you know, debated and uh, members of Congress were very much aware of it. Sort of the bad news for now is that the repeal of the provision uh, did not survive that, that budget effort uh, this, this time uh, around. But I think it puts us in a somewhat better posture for the future. Well, a lot of th people, members of Congress, are talking about things um, short of outright repeal. Uh, and what might those things look like? There are essentially three categories of other changes 
uh, that, that would uh, potentially be made to the Cadillac tax. The first one is to establish an actuarial value safe harbor. And the way this would work is it would say that any plan that is, and they could pick a number anywhere, the number that's been talked about is an 85% actuarial value plan. If the plan were 85% actuarial value or less, then regardless of how much it cost in actual dollar terms, uh, it would sort of get a free pass. It would not be deemed to trigger the Cadillac tax. Uh, other changes uh, would be to have more realistic indexing of those thresholds. As I think you may know, right now those thresholds of $10,200 uh, for single coverage and $27,500 for family coverage uh, would, after the first year, be indexed to the general consumer price index, general inflation, even though we know that, you know, over the decade, healthcare costs have risen at about twice the rate of general inflation. So over time, the Cadillac tax could become very much like the alternative minimum tax was when it started out. It was intended to affect just a small handful of taxpayers and ultimately grew to affect a lot. Likewise, the Cadillac tax may be designed, intended to affect just a small group of expensive plans, but over time, uh, the way it would be indexed uh, would uh, capture many, many more. So the idea here is to change the indexing feature so that it rises more in concert with actual increases in medical costs. Uh, and then, of course, very importantly, just changing the elements that sort of, if you will, go into the bucket of things that actually get counted in determining whether or not you trigger the tax. Things like uh, on-site clinics, um, potentially some types of wellness programs, flexible spending arrangements, health savings accounts, all of those things, if, if some of those or all of those could be sort of removed and the focus would be a little bit more uh, narrow, then obviously many, many more uh, employers would have a lot more breathing room before triggering the tax. So all of these different things are, are potentially in play. At the same time, of course, um, there's a parallel regulatory effort that's going on related to the 40% tax, and the Treasury Department and Internal Revenue Service uh, have now issued uh, two notices and received comments uh, on them, dealing with a whole variety of different uh, questions, and uh, perhaps one of the most important ones being that one that's the third bullet uh, on the screen there, and that is how does the Cadillac tax potentially uh, interact with the employer shared responsibility penalty mandate. Because over time, certainly in some higher cost areas of the country, we'll get to a point where even a 60% actuarial value plan, a minimum that's permitted under the Affordable Care Act, uh, will be over those dollar thresholds and potentially trigger the tax. And then plan, employer plan sponsors will be in really an untenable situation, right? Because you'll either provide a minimum value 60% actuarial value plan and have to be confronting the 40% excise tax, or you'll lower the value of the plan below 60% and then be subject to the employer penalty mandate as well. So we said in our comment letters and in our meetings with the agency people, you have to fix this problem. You cannot put employer, if you want to preserve the employer-based system, you cannot have a situation where employers have to choose between one type of penalty or another type of penalty. What are the next steps? The next steps, of course, is to gather uh, all of this information and come up with some proposed regulations. And we actually were just chatting about this a little bit in the break right before we got started here. And there really are two strategies <laughs> that might play themselves out on, on this. And right now, it's really not clear, and I don't think the Obama administration has yet clear in its mind which of the two strategies it's going to pursue. One strategy would be that they'll try to get the uh, guidance out just as quickly as possible uh, early next year on the theory that any regulations that come out within 60 days uh, before a new administration takes place automatically can be subject to review and being pulled back. So if the Obama administration is eager to have its sort of uh, imprint on these uh, rules, they're going to want to try to get it out as early in 2016 as possible. The other theory is that nothing that they do uh, is going to satisfy their constituencies. And as this issue grows and grows in terms of its controversy, they may just decide to punt on this and leave it to the next administration to actually finalize the rules. So they'll do some preliminary work, but they'll actually leave it till sometime in 2017, which of course, unless it's repealed between now and then, 
will leave uh, employers and everyone else with a very short window of opportunity to actually uh, figure out and answer all the questions about how it's going to actually be implemented. So I'm, I'm putting my money actually on the, on the first option, that they actually will get it out fairly early next year uh, and we'll have you know, good, bad, or indifferent. Uh, we will see what it is that they, how they answer the questions on a number of the implementation uh, features of it. Shakespeare said, what is decreed must be. And so unlike the 40% tax, the future of which is at best a little bit unknown, one of the things that clearly is known uh, is that we're all facing the reality of the employer reporting requirements uh, within the next few months. Um, and I think that you know, if it were simply a question of granting some relief to employers, um, that um, the administration would be inclined, if it could, to delay this provision once again, notwithstanding the fact that the Obama administration got sued by the House of Representatives for delaying the employer uh, uh, provisions uh, of, of the law. But, it, but the reality is, of course, that the IRS needs this information as well, because it's not just a question of determining whether or not you all are complying with the employer mandate provisions. It's also a matter of the federal government needing to know whether or not premium tax credits are available uh, to individuals uh, because whether or not they have been offered uh, affordable minimum value coverage. So uh, we're, we're plowing ahead, or more accurately, I should say you all are plowing ahead, undoubtedly with um, you know, some mixed results and, and, and engaging various uh, outside uh, experts to try to help uh, wind your way through this, this process. There has been, I should, I should tell you, uh, bipartisan legislation that has been introduced in both the House and the Senate that would essentially create a new employer reporting uh, regimen, a voluntary prospective reporting um, question, even if this legislation were to pass, and it's not exactly moving on a fast track at the moment, um, you know, to what extent would it provide the type of relief that you need once you've gone to the effort and expense of putting into place the type of uh, mechanisms that you're putting in now in order to comply with the employer reporting. But it certainly is a, a good, well-intentioned uh, effort. I think the best news that I can leave with you relative to the employer reporting uh, piece of this is that the IRS is fully aware of how complex this is. And they know that it's not just a challenge for the regulated employer community to comply, but they're not exactly sure what they're going to do with all of this data and how they're going to use this data, how they're going to actually make uh, the pieces all come together. So I think that we should definitely, can definitely expect for the next year and maybe even the next two years that they will enforce this provision with a rather light touch. And as long as you can demonstrate that you made a reasonable good faith effort to comply with the law, however challenging that is, however expensive that is, uh, I don't expect that they will come down hard on, on employers if, if they didn't get it just exactly right. So that maybe can be a little small comfort to take away from, from this morning in terms of what I'm sure is occupying a big uh, chunk of your days uh, uh, these last several months. The first thing we do, let's kill all the lawyers, one of the most famous lines from Shakespeare. Uh, and uh, even a lawyer like me would tend to agree that that's appropriate. And I think this one sort of came to mind uh, uh, about a year ago uh, as it relates to wellness programs uh, and to some uh, significant activity on the part of the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission uh, to go after uh, a number of companies uh, over their wellness programs and saying that those programs uh, violated the Americans with Disabilities Act. So this litigation that was um, filed by the EEOC gave rise to legislation in both the House of Representatives and the Senate called the Preserving Employee Wellness Programs Act. And in truth, I don't think that the authors of this legislation really ever uh, expected to push this legislation forward. It was really introduced for the principal purpose of um, kind of sending a shot across the bow of, uh, of the EEOC to get them to finally issue some guidance as it relates to the intersection of wellness programs and the Americans Dis with Disabilities Act. So the legislation essentially says that plans complying with HIPAA or the Affordable Care Act uh, sort of by definition will not violate the Americans with Disabilities Act and it, it extends the protection to uh, participatory plans that offer incentives that are consistent with HIPAA 
and the ACA. So uh, it had somewhat of the desired uh, effect, this legislation did, in the sense that it really encouraged the EOC to finally come forward with some mostly helpful guidance as it relates to, uh, to wellness programs and the, and the ADA. We are still waiting, if you will, for the other shoe to drop in terms of some forthcoming guidance from the EOC on how wellness programs uh, intersect with the Genetic Information Non-Discrimination Act. So there still is more work to be done uh, along those lines and to see uh, what they say and how much latitude they give in terms of the operation of wellness programs. So that's kind of where we are in terms of, I would say, call it the short term relative to the most of the significant provisions of the Affordable Care Act. I want to kind of take this the next step as we move into Act Two of this Shakespearean play uh, and look at the issue of tax policy and how it intersects with health benefits um, beyond the 40% excise tax. Words pay no debts, but uh, actions do. And one of the issues that's most prominent in the minds of members of Congress in both political parties, actually, uh, is the extent to which the uh, revenue loss that's associated with employer-sponsored health coverage uh, presents a challenge in terms of gaining control of the federal deficit, uh, and to what extent it can be a useful element of whatever effort might be made in the future in terms of comprehensive reform of the tax code, which is actually something that both Democrats and Republicans would like to see happen, undoubtedly, under the next president and the next Congress. So this chart demonstrates the extent to which um, employer-sponsored health benefits uh, sits as a very prominent piece of this deficit picture. This chart shows the estimated tax expenditures for the next 10 years. And a tax expenditure is any provision of the Internal Revenue Code that accounts for lost revenue to the federal government. So for example, the um, deduction that you get uh, from the interest that you pay on your mortgage, that's a tax expenditure. The deductibility that you get on your federal return for the state and local taxes that you pay is an expenditure. Charitable contributions uh, deduction is an expenditure. Well, the largest expenditure in the entire federal budget is the one that is attributable to employer-sponsored coverage. Why is that? Because they apply the same rationale to health coverage overall that they do to what I described earlier about the Cadillac tax. Namely, they make the estimate that every dollar that you spend on health care coverage for your employees is a dollar that would otherwise be paid to those employees in the form of taxable wages. They actually concede that some portion of it would be paid in the form of other benefits, which might or might not be tax favored, but that the bulk of it would be paid in the form of taxable wages. So consequently, they estimate that 2.6 trillion, with a T, trillion dollars of tax revenue will not be collected by the federal government over the course of the next 10 years because employer-sponsored coverage is provided on a tax favored basis. The second largest expenditure, by the way, is in the retirement area. So that's the number that, that looms out there. Uh, and really, therefore, is at the heart of any serious effort to either you know, undertake comprehensive tax reform, where they would you know, lower the rates on individuals or corporations, or develop a territorial tax system to repatriate earnings from overseas, or expand the research and development credit, or whatever else they might do with respect to tax reform. There is this big, big $2.6 trillion of foregone revenue, which if they can monkey around with it, they can sort of quote unquote pay for making other changes to the tax code or use it to reduce the deficit. So what are some of the different ideas that have been bandied about to extract some revenue from employer-sponsored health coverage? Well, one idea is to reduce actually the 40% uh, Cadillac tax to 12%, but to set up some sort of a limit on the extent to which employer-sponsored coverage would be excludable from income taxes. And this proposal actually came out two years ago uh, from the Bipartisan Commission on Fiscal Responsibility and Reform, uh, a group that was put together by Congress uh, and the President to come up with a whole host of different methods by which we could sort of get our federal financial house in order. Another idea that's been put out uh, within the last well, less than a year now, has been to limit 
it's sort of, I, I call this one sort of the Cadillac tax that's applicable not to employers but to individuals. And it would limit the excludability from income of employer-sponsored coverage to $12,000 for single coverage or $30,000 for family coverage. It also would provide, if you, if you don't get coverage from your employer, but instead you go out into the individual marketplace and purchase a plan, it also would provide you a standard deduction on your tax return of $12,000 if you bought single coverage or of $30,000 if you bought family coverage. Even if the plan that you buy out in the individual marketplace doesn't cost $12,000 or $30,000. So if you can find a cheaper plan out there, you'll still get this big tax benefit if you buy it individually and don't get it through your employer. Where do you think that proposal came from? It comes from the Republican repeal and replace Obamacare proposal. So even though there are a lot of Republicans who are lined up opposed to the Cadillac tax, philosophically, they're in a place of saying, you know what, we really, as a matter of public policy, ought to be limiting the tax excludability of employer-sponsored coverage. An interesting question for you all to sort of contemplate, were this to become law, and individuals were to be taxed on employer-sponsored coverage, but would get a standard deduction on individually purchased coverage, how would that change the dynamics in terms of whether or not, in some of your organizations, whether or not your employees wanted to get their coverage from you? If they were going to be subject to a tax because you're providing them uh, uh, you know, a robust plan that happens to trigger the threshold, but they feel like they would get a good enough plan uh, elsewhere out in the individual marketplace. So if something like this were to happen, that would substantially change the nature of the, of the bargain, if you will, and the, the dynamics and the incentives uh, for being uh, involved in an employer-sponsored system. And then sort of a third idea that uh, takes a somewhat different approach is not to look at rich plans at all, but instead look at rich people and to limit the excludability of employer-sponsored health coverage uh, on people who are earning above a certain income threshold, regardless of whether what they're being provided is a bare bones plan or a very generous plan. And where did that proposal come from? That came from then candidate Hillary Clinton when she ran for president eight years ago. Uh, and she has not yet spoken to this issue in terms of the current campaign, but it will be very interesting to see as the weeks and months unfold here whether or not that's a position that she still embraces in terms of a way of extracting some revenue from uh, employer-sponsored health care system. The long-term strategic vision. So as I said at the outset, um, we undertook an effort a couple of years ago to try to envision what the employee benefits system might look like or need to look like in the year 2020 uh, and beyond, both with respect to health and the other half of what we do, which is retirement. Um, and to establish a certain set of goals and then to develop uh, a number of recommendations, 46 recommendations in, to be specific, that would actually help get us from here to there in terms of either changes that would be made in, in legislation or changes that would be made in regulation. And you'll be pleased to know that I'm not going to go through all 46. Uh, but I do want to share with you just three of them that relate to the future of employer-sponsored health coverage and some potential longer-term changes that could be made around the Affordable Care Act, uh, assuming that it does not ultimately get repealed and that we have to live with it and that we have to uh, make changes to make it more administrable. Men at some time are masters of their fate, uh, Shakespeare wrote in Julius Caesar. And, um, and uh, master, being the master of your fate sort of segues into the whole concept of defined contribution, healthcare coverage. So the concept goes something like this, that right now, as you know, you cannot put money into an account for your employees, which they can then turn around and go use to purchase coverage from the public exchanges, right? So the idea here would be, and this is not for every employer by any means, but this might be attractive to some employers, is to say, okay, you can create a health reimbursement account type of vehicle or something similar to that. The employer would put money into it, and it would be money that would be representative of what would be needed to have affordable coverage uh, uh, in the exchanges. 
the employer would be relieved of the employer mandate by virtue of putting the money into such an account. The employee then could use that account to go out into the public exchange and purchase whichever plan they wanted to. And the federal government would potentially also be a winner in this arrangement because unlike the situation, particularly with the encroaching 40% Cadillac tax that might be pushing employers out of the system, absent something like this, the federal government is going to be picking up the cost of subsidies for some portion of individuals who don't have employer-sponsored coverage, right? So this way, individuals wouldn't be able to double dip if their employer did something like this, kind of transition to some sort of a, if you will, defined contribution type arrangement. The employer would be relieved of the penalty. The individual would actually have the financial wherewithal to go out into the exchange and purchase the coverage, and the federal government would not have to provide subsidies to those individuals. They would actually have enough money in the account to pay for the plan that they get. So there actually is bipartisan legislation that has been introduced that would permit this type of arrangement, but initially just for small employers with 50 or fewer employees. So if something like this actually gets some traction, uh, this might be an option for some smaller employers, and it might over time get expanded uh, for larger employers uh, as well. Again, doesn't work for everybody, but it's sort of one piece of the puzzle, and particularly one that might be more attractive as employers face the prospect of the 40% tax. We have slashed the snake, but have not killed it. The snake, of course, that we're talking about is Cobra. Um, and this is something that's actually been talked about really since even before the Affordable Care Act was enacted. The idea that if the law works as it's intended to, uh, and if the exchanges prove to be a venue where individuals can get affordable cover, good service, affordable coverage, good plans, um, then maybe you don't even need uh, COBRA anymore. Uh, not just because uh, getting rid of COBRA would be a great relief to employer plan sponsors, but it could actually be a far better deal for a lot of individuals as well, right? Because you know, for a number of people who become, say, COBRA eligible because they've lost their job, you know, far better to go into the exchange and buy a bronze plan or a silver plan and likely be eligible for a subsidy from the federal government to boot, rather than to pay 102% of their former employer's gold plan or platinum plan. So there actually is some opportunity here. If Congress is not in the mood for outright repeal, there might be some other approaches that could be undertaken. For example, it, you know, it might be true that an individual uh, has already met their uh, deductible for the year or their maximum out-of-pocket uh, limit. And so then sort of why should they then be you know, forced to go into the exchange and start all over again? So the idea here is, all right, if, if you wouldn't outright repeal uh, COBRA, perhaps you would have a change the law so that an individual would be able to remain on their employer's plan for the duration of that plan year. But once the new plan year would start, they would have the opportunity to obtain coverage, hopefully within it, with a subsidy to help them out uh, in the federal exchanges or the state exchanges. Something is rotten in the state of Denmark, they said in Hamlet. I can't speak to what's going on in Denmark, but I can tell you that there are some potentially good or rotten things that are, could be happening in the 50 states under a provision of the Affordable Care Act, which is sort of the sleeper issue in the Affordable Care Act, as far as I'm concerned, called the State Innovation Waiver Provision. How many people have heard about this provision of the Affordable Care Act? This could become really, really big. It goes essentially like this, that starting in the year 2017, but actually starting essentially now because states would be able to make this request to go into effect in 2017. The states can come to the federal executive branch agencies, specifically to the Department of Treasury and the Department of Health and Human Services, and they can ask for a waiver uh, to allow them to implement the Affordable Care Act uh, as they believe is appropriate as long as they can make a showing to those federal branch agencies that to allow the states to do this will not end up costing the federal government any more than the federal government was expecting to pay in the form of subsidies uh, to individuals. And as written, it is fairly open-ended in terms of permitting the states to uh, make all sorts of changes to employer requirements, employer reporting requirements, the nature of the benefits package, you name it. Uh, pretty, pretty broad-based. If the executive branch agencies 
uh, interpret this waiver authority very, very narrowly in terms of what they allow the states to do, it's probably not going to be a big deal. Uh, on the other hand, to the extent that they interpret it quite broadly, and one administration's interpretation could vary quite tremendously from another administration's interpretation, uh, this could present a real challenge to the employer plan sponsor community. Uh, because there could be all sorts of, uh, as I said a moment ago, reporting requirements for those companies that operate in multiple states. You know, it'll never be the same in two states, and so you may have multiple different type of standards that you'll have to uh, uh, comply with. It could really sort of drive a stake into the heart of federal ERISA preemption, the opportunity to sort of operate under a uniform uh, federal approach very, very dramatically. Whoops, what happened here? The theater went dark, I guess, in the shake right. Um, it was thought at first that this provision might be very attractive to sort of, if I could call it that, sort of left-leaning states, that they might want to go further than the Affordable Care Act did. States like Vermont that had pursued for a while the concept of a single-payer system. Now the thinking is that this state innovation waiver concept, which is not, sort of, it's more than a concept, it's a provision in the law, uh, could be very attractive to a number of states that really don't like the Affordable Care Act at all. Um, and that they might say, okay, well, the, the only way that we're going to sort of live with this federal government uh, is if you allow us to do this, 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 and this, please give us the authority to do so. A lot of states, in fairness to the states, have some really big decisions to make in the next couple of years. Are they going to expand the Medicaid programs as was envisioned under the Affordable Care Act? Uh, are they going to take over from the federal government the operation of the exchanges? So the states have a great deal of leverage, I think, with the federal government to say, give us this uh, authority to tax employers uh, to help pay for it or to, or to require this kind of information to be provided, et cetera, et cetera, in exchange for us, the states, taking over this responsibility from you, the federal government. And I think that sort of where Democrats and Republicans stand on these issues all of a sudden becomes very blurred uh, once you start getting into a dialogue like that. Because, frankly, you know, members of Congress, as sh they should, whether regardless of the political party that they may be a member of, want to be attentive to the uh, needs of their own state. And so if their governors and their state legislatures have gone to the effort of saying, this is how we want to design the way we're going to comply with the Affordable Care Act, I think members of Congress of either political party are going to be very, very attentive to that. And I think that in many respects, the federal government will be more than happy to sort of hand over a lot of this responsibility and a lot of the political pain for raising taxes and all the rest of it over to the governors and the state legislatures. So keep your eye on this state innovation waiver uh, provision of the law. So I want to conclude here by doing the political outlook. Cheryl asked me to say, take a look at the presidential race and, uh, and what it looks like in terms of uh, the, different, the different candidates. Um, all the candidates agree on one thing. I like this place and willingly could waste my time in it. So regardless of what they may think about uh, or how they may agree or disagree on other aspects of their policies, uh, this is one thing that they're all singing it in unison around. Uh, so let's take a look at the candidates, and uh, as Shakespeare said, whoops, don't want to, if you have tears, prepare to shed them now. As we take a look, let's start out first with the Republican candidates. So there's actually a line in Shakespeare's play, The Tempest, I think it's Act 2, Scene 5, that in this one line describes four of the Republican candidates, and it goes as follows. Be not afraid of greatness. Isn't, isn't that exactly Donald Trump's uh, motto? Some are born great. It helps if you're born into a political dynasty. Some achieve greatness. Ben Carson, born in abject poverty, rose to be a world-renowned neurosurgeon. And some have greatness thrust upon them. What better training to be president than to drive your company into the ground and then lose your Senate race by 30 points? But that's not all. We also have Chris Christie in the race. He hath eaten me out of house and home. <laughs> and that's mean. God knows I could stand to lose about 25 pounds myself. Age, I do abhor thee. Youth, I do adore thee. 
So I think that Rubio sort of stands a good chance here as sort of the, the nice balance between being an outsider by, by virtue of his youth, uh, but also having some experience there. We'll have to see how that all plays out. Tempt not a desperate man, says Ted Cruz. I don't know about you, and I don't want to make any judgments here, but any guy who sort of accuses the leader of his own party of being a liar in order to prove that he's a Washington outsider, he's getting a little bit desperate in terms of his race for the presidency. Governor Huckabee, an ordained minister. He knows that the devil can cite scripture for his purposes. And what about the rest of the field? The fool doth think he is wise, but the wise man knows himself to be a fool. Now, I'm not going to say which of them is wise and which of them may be fools. I'll only point out that all the recent public opinion polls have shown that no opinion scores higher than any of these candidates remaining in the race. And then who knows, you know, maybe there'll be one of the candidates from four years ago who will reappear and still jump into the race. Newts and blind worms do no wrong. I came across this quote and I figured, I gotta figure out how to get Newt Gingrich into the speech one way or the other. <laughs> what about on the Democratic side? Well, for a while there it looked like Vice President Biden was gonna jump into the race, but I think he ultimately concluded that, as Shakespeare says, what's past is prologue and his third race for the presidency would end up like the first two did. These two folks, you saw the debate, life is as tedious as a twice told tale vexing the dull ear of a drowsy man. That was sort of how they came across. And uh, the gentleman on the uh, right there is Lincoln Chafee. Um, sure enough, I finished this slide on Friday afternoon, uh, and he dropped out of the race Friday evening. Uh, how many of you knew that Lincoln Chafee had dropped out of the race between Friday and today? How many of you knew that he was in the race to begin with <laughs> before Friday? So it pretty much leaves O'Malley to fulfill that particular segment of the, uh, of the marketplace. I'll not budge an inch, says Bernie Sanders. That could be his campaign slogan, certainly. And I think that pretty much covers all the candidates, doesn't it? Have I missed anybody? <laughs> oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Though I'm not naturally honest, I am so sometimes by chance. What do they say about health care? Well, so far they've said uh, very little in terms of the details around health care. Um, for the most part, the message from the Republicans has been still a focus on repealing the Affordable Care Act. Uh, Jeb Bush certainly has the most uh, detailed of, of the proposals of anybody on the, really of anybody on in either party uh, as it relates to his, sort of his vision. Uh, and he put out this 10 page thing, you can get it off of his, his website. Uh, it provides tax credits for the purchase of portable plans. Uh, it allows uh, higher limits on HSAs, caps the tax exclusion uh, on employer-sponsored coverage, this concept that we just talked about a moment ago. Um, not too clear on exactly how he would achieve this, but he says the right things relative to facilitating transparency on cost and outcomes and quality. Uh, financial incentives for wellness programs, he sort of is aware of the, the challenges that have been uh, presented to a lot of employers uh, from the EOC um, and, uh, and wants to enable, facilitate small business contributions to portable plans that people could take along with them. So it's, it's, worth, it's worth a little bit more of an in-depth read. Um, the Democrats have been focused more on just preserving the Affordable Care Act and not wanting to be too forthcoming about areas of the law that require uh, changes for fear that it might lead to sort of a beginning of a conversation about unraveling uh, the law. Uh, both uh, Secretary Clinton and Senator Sanders, however, uh, do support uh, the repeal of the Cadillac tax. They are on record now as doing so. Um, they both have sort of provisions in their, uh, you know, in their, um, uh, on their websites under their health policy about lowering copays and deductibles, but don't really elaborate on what it is they mean by that. Uh, and just last week, uh, uh, Secretary Clinton um, gave a speech in which she expressed some real concerns about the implications for the health care system uh, by virtue of the consolidation of a number of major uh, health insurance carriers. So not a specific public policy proposal by any means, but, um, but definitely a, a recognition that she wants to do something uh, related to that whole issue if she becomes president. And my last quote, 
what a fool honesty is, a quote from Shakespeare's play, The Winter's Tale. And this is where I have to make a confession. Uh, because you know that very, very first quote I put out there from about at a quarter century, thou doth have success? I totally made that up. <laughs> I needed to figure out a way to get from this Shakespeare idea, you know, and relate it back to the Alliance. But while the quote is entirely made up, all the other ones are legitimate quotes from Shakespeare, by the way. While that quote is made up, the basic message of it is one that I very sincerely want to convey. Because um, a quarter century uh, of doing this you know, is a great record of success. And all of this policy stuff, of course, is, is in many respects the background noise uh, that either facilitates or provides uh, an obstacle for doing what it is that you all are doing um, at the front lines. And uh, the work that you're doing is sort of to demand sort of greater accountability, to, um, to make sure that you know, you're providing good coverage at affordable rates uh, for the people covered in the plans, is really what informs the policymakers when, for the most part, they really want to do the right thing, even though they don't always get it right. So I, I really hope that you all feel very good about what you're doing uh, in your own companies and through the collective efforts of the Alliance, because I can tell you from the, from the standpoint of those of us who you know, work in this whole policy realm, what you're doing is really what matters, and, and that you really are the ones in control of the information that if you can share it with the public policymakers, uh, could really make a difference in terms of uh, how they understand these issues, because, uh, because they can't possibly understand it as well as you do. So on your 25th anniversary, I salute you. Uh, and as Shakespeare said, hopefully all's well that ends well. Thank you very much. Jim, thank you. That was fabulous. We have time for questions. So please uh, make your way to the microphones. There's one on either side of the room. And while people are formulating their questions, Jim, maybe I can just get us started. So sure. the last comment that you made about um, you know, those of us on the ground doing the work um, have stories that could help policymakers, could inform policymakers. Um, how, how do you suggest that we uh, get involved? How can we be more effective in connecting with policymakers um, and helping them understand what, for instance, the impact of the Affordable Care Act, Care Act is on real businesses? Well, I think that uh, one very important uh, and sort of, sort of a lower cost way of doing it uh, is just to take advantage of the fact when uh, members of Congress are back home in their district uh, to you know, kind of go to the town hall meetings and to raise these issues. Um, you know, it's a little bit tougher sometimes to get through to the senators, but you know, they they pass through and you know, use that opportunities. A number of your companies undoubtedly have um, you know government affairs uh, offices, and, uh, and and those offices are in contact you know with the elected officials most often about you know your industry issues, but they do take up these matters uh, as well. Um, it's a little bit harder, I have to confess, uh, than it was back in the old days when I worked on Capitol Hill to actually get letters uh, through uh, and to make sure that your emails are being read. But I think they, when it comes from a constituent, I can tell you they do get read. Uh, and one can always sort of do it the old-fashioned way, frankly, and pick up the phone. So, you know, invite the members of Congress to come to your facility to meet with your employees um, to the extent that it works with your company culture. To, um, to, to let the employees be the face of all of this and to say how these different things affect them, you know, what the implications might be of the 40% tax uh, if it's allowed to go into effect uh, in, as, as currently structured. Uh, all of those things are, are messages that they want to hear. And I can, I can tell you that um, it, it doesn't actually have to be a lot of messages. You know, in the absence of members of Congress and their staff hearing uh, sort of very much from the other side, it can just be a few phone calls or a few visits or a few uh, letters to the extent that they wane their way through the, the process. 
and, um, and just sort of, you know, give them the evidence and say, this is how many people that we have that, you know, are in the state of Wisconsin of our employees, or this is how many people who live in your congressional district, and this is what we're doing for them in terms of, you know, this wellness program, and in the absence of you know, being able to continue it, you know, we're going to lose these, these kinds of benefits. So um, I would just say, whatever your message is, uh, do get engaged. I mean, it's, it's and I've gone on too long on answering your question, but, you know, it's the thing that's frankly kept me interested in this arena because I always felt like if I weren't an optimist, I couldn't sort of be doing this year after year after year. But I, I have to, I mean, I've made a lot of fun of, of, of elected officials in this presentation, but, um, but I do respect what they do. I do respect the fact that they can't possibly be experts in all the fields that they have to know about, tax policy, foreign policy, defense policy, health policy. Uh, but you do have that expertise. Excellent. Um, if there isn't another question, I have one, uh, which is this, it, and this isn't, it may be so much a question as an observation that I'm looking for uh, a confirmation of. So one of the headlines from your talk this morning is that um, regardless of whether the excise tax is repealed or not, we've made some significant commitments that are, are likely to be unfunded. If the excise tax stays in effect, but our assumption about the 75% right. of money coming from taxable wages is false, we, you know, that's a big shortfall. If the excise tax is repealed, um, we need to, we, we, the, the yep. commitments are made through right. the Affordable Care Act. Right. So do you have some thoughts about how we balance that or where the money, either where the money can come from or what we should back off of. That is a really astute observation and it's absolutely right because you know, th these are how these things get officially scored, but how it actually plays out in terms of actual employer or employee behavior and the tax dollars that are then collected can be a very different story. And in fairness, you know, I mean, I think the assumptions that underlie the, what they do uh, are flawed, as I indicated, but in fairness, you know, to them, you know, none of us can predict the future with any great accuracy, right? So, so there is a real disconnect there, and I think that it, it's going to, uh, at first, lead to a um, uh, to a to pressure, uh, frankly, to increase the level of the penalties, uh, not just the forty percent penalty, but sort of the individual mandate penalty and the employer penalty as well in order to, to uh, finance the, uh, the subsidies. You know, on the other hand, you know, to the extent that uh, employers are driven out of the system and more people you know, are getting coverage in the uh, exchanges, um, you know, is, that gonna be a, is that gonna be good or bad for the exchange? Well, the answer is gonna differ depending on what state you're in and what the nature of the, of the workforce that ends up getting their coverage from the state. In some instances, it may be a bunch of young people who will be healthy and be paying premiums, and that'll be a good thing. In other places, it'll be different. Um, and it'll be uh, you know, a different kind of political pressure. So one way or the other, there is going to be um, a, a demand for more revenue. I think that the, the, the best thing that we can do uh, from a, a national level and a policy level is to do what you're doing right here uh, through the Alliance, which is to on the ground make these efforts to mitigate healthcare cost increases. And then the demand and the need for greater subsidies will be likewise lessened. Uh, because if it has to just be done through, you know, taking it out of this person's pocket or that person's sort of like nobody's a winner, right? Everybody right. loses something. To the extent that we actually can put into place more effective purchasing, um, then we're all winners. Yeah, I would agree, and, and improving health as well. I mean, that, that, right. uh, that's a key uh, way to bring down health care totally. costs. Totally. Yes, exactly. Absolutely. Any uh, other questions for Jim? Well, please join me in thanking Jim. Excellent presentation, Jim. Thank you. Thank you.